Alvaro, can you join us, please? And to check on the settings. Oh, here it is. Are you able? Okay, we are going to get uh, started. Uh, uh, I'll share the screen here. And uh, we checked out that uh, the second midterm is on Monday, October 31st. All right, so that answers your question for sure now. And if it's not programmed uh, correctly in the assignments uh, sheet here, let's check it again. Uh, Oops. It won't go down. It goes, should go down. Thirty one ten, yeah. So uh, we still have today's lecture, Friday's lecture, and uh, followed by the third lecture later on. Uh, let us uh, make sure we are uh, recording. Uh, Uh, it doesn't show that you are recording. I'm sorry. Okay, it is recording. Yeah, all right. And uh, you haven't been able to join us, so we'll have to go. Bless you. Okay, we have uh, covered uh, uh, quite a bit of material uh, so far. And uh, what uh, we are emphasizing right now is what we would call the phenomenology. Uh, what are the phenomena that happen when we have reactor accidents following the first part where we dealt with the concept of risk. Uh, some of the phenomena is the loss of coolant accident. We built a very simple model based on the equations of fluid flow, where we conserve energy, we conserve momentum, and uh, we conserve uh, 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 mass, or the conservation equation in that case. Uh, we, cover, uh, we followed it by uh, describing the process of cooling the debris, or what is left after a core uh, meltdown. And uh, we also dealt with another phenomenology, that happened in accidents that we'll cover later on, which was the steam explosions. And these were very uh, uh, serious events that did indeed happen 
as we, as far as we know, in the Chernobyl accident, as well maybe in the Fukushima in uh, uh, unit number four in Fukushima, and it is not uh, highly acknowledged yet. There are other uh, accidents that can happen. Uh, one of them uh, has been turned into a movie, the China Syndrome. Uh, of course, we know already that is not possible, but we'll study it anyway. And uh, the glad, glad ballooning accident, and then we find that uh, containment structures are built so as to uh, mitigate the effects of those types of accidents. So today, we uh, consider the clad ballooning uh, accident. So what is a clad ballooning uh, accident? Uh, a clad ballooning occurs if the uh, helium gas that is uh, injected in between uh, the fuel, the fuel pellets are made of uranium dioxide, a ceramic, it is porous, it contains the gaseous uh, fission products and prevents them from leaking. And they are encased inside a container that we call the cladding, uh, a tube basically where those uranium dioxide pellets are stacked on top of each other. Now, in some part of the tube, the, there is a contact between uh, the fuel and the cladding. Uh, so it is filled up with the gas. The gas in that case is helium. It also helps to detect any leaks because the ends of those fuel elements have uh, to be uh, welded on both ends. So in that case, you can detect the helium if the welding is not uh, correct. So that is a helium gas fill out as a bonding, thermal bonding between the ceramic uranium dioxide and the metallic, uh, in that case, uh, zircaloy is mostly used in existing reactor. Uh, Zircaloy is a trade name. It's a, an alloy, in fact, of zirconium uh, with some chromium. And uh, 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 that alloy of zirconium has two interesting properties. One of them is that it resists corrosion. Obviously, we don't want corrosion inside the core of our reactor. And second, it also does not absorb neutrons appreciably. So it helps us with uh, the chain reaction uh, in that case. Suppose that uh, there isn't enough uh, uh, cooling of those uh, fuel elements. In that case, you'll find uh, under normal conditions that the coolant circulates between the fuel element. It has contact with the surface. Uh, the fission occurs in the uranium, in the uranium dioxide. The heat is transferred through the, the, the fuel uh, pellets uh, to the helium gap in between uh, to the uh, cladding and to the coolant, everything is normal. Notice here that in between the fuel elements, they are in a matrix of 17 by 17 uh, in a typical pressurized water reactor. You'll find that there is enough uh, gap for the coolant to circulate around the pellet and uh, extract uh, the heat. Uh, these are spacers here. If you look at it like almost like a basket uh, uh, at different levels made out of steel, and in that case, the uh, elements, if the flow is, uh, uh, the, the cladding, if the flow is moving, uh, does not vibrate. It's prevented from vibrating. Now, other uh, fission product gases also end up building up, such as cry uh, krypton. That's not kryptonite. It's not Superman. That's krypton is a noble gas like xenon, like neon, like helium. And uh, uh, those uh, fission product gases, uh, krypton, the xenon, and the iodine. Iodine at room temperature, you may have it in your uh, pharmacy closet in the bathroom. You'll find that iodine at room temperature is a liquid. But when you heat it to the level of reactor accent, it is a gas. So if this uh, fission product build up in the matrix of the fuel, uh, they exert basically pressure uh, on the cladding on the outside. Uh, if you get an accident where there isn't enough cooling and uh, an obstruction will happen, and in fact, we, get, we got at least one accident where pieces of metal uh, flew up and obstructed the flow here of the coolant to the fuel element, then heating up would occur, and you'll find that that cladding starts swelling, and uh, the name for it is uh, clad ballooning. So what happens if you get uh, clad ballooning, you'll find that the clad uh, swells, balloons in fact, and then starts touching the channels and the flow of the coolant, whether you look at this diagram here or this diagram, is obstructed. And it becomes a positive feedback effect. The 
ballooning could be caused by uh, overheating in a localized overheating and then uh, you obstruct the flow you even make it worse and uh, it's a positive feedback and you end up with a melting of the uh, cladding first of course and then uh, melting of the uh, fuel so this is an accent that uh, we have to worry about and it occurs uh, if the external coolant pressure becomes less than the internal pressure inside the cladding uh, and the cladding uh, literally swells and uh, undergoes a ballooning process uh, if the temperature is high enough the cladding can even burst and if it bursts, you release the fission products uh, into the coolant. Uh, the most serious results from clad ballooning is that it may cause the blockage of the flow channel. And of course, uh, this would be a permanent restriction of the coolant flow. And uh, you can lose the core. Eventually, the cladding oxidizes, meaning it burns. If it oxidizes uh, with a high temperature of the water in the form of steam, H2O plus any metal generates hydrogen, and you get a secondary effect later on where the hydrogen now is very reactive, and we saw it happen if you watch the videos of the uh, Fukushima accident in that case. A coolant flow restriction results in an increase in the cladding and fuel temperatures, uh, resulting in severe damage even to the point where you burn the cladding, you oxidize it, it becomes a powder, it becomes brittle first, and then becomes a powder and falls to the bottom of the core. And this is uh, what we dealt with in the previous chapter. Uh, chapter. You have to continue uh, cooling the core, otherwise uh, you get very serious meltdown. Uh, this uh, process has been simulated in many ways in what we are going to call later on the evaluation, safety analysis, computational uh, uh, models. And uh, this may reveal that the calculated temperatures rise actually within the range for clad ballooning. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you'll find uh, that uh, uh, there are a different uh, 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 collection of computer code that are called the best estimate safety analysis computational models or codes. Now, the evaluation models are the codes or uh, models that a utility or an operational, uh, somebody operating a nuclear reactor uh, has to uh, 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 run uh, to convince the regulatory agencies, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that their reactor is running safely. Those evaluation models are owned by the manufacturers, companies like Toshiba, Westinghouse, General Electric, and uh, uh, they are proprietary. They are not available to members of the public. And say, if a utility is required to run one of one of those evaluation models, they have to pay. Uh, the architect engineer like Sargent and Lundy in Chicago, these are some names, or the General Electric Company, millions of dollars, $10 million maybe for a simple study or an evaluation to satisfy the safety regulatory uh, requirement. Uh, however, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has also developed what we call the best estimate codes. Uh, and uh, this would be also available uh, in that case to the utility uh, uh, for a nominal price, not the millions of dollars, but some companies have taken up the, uh, uh, the process of maintaining those codes to satisfy maybe new computer platforms. Uh, and in that case, uh, uh, there are many names. For instance, the RETRAN code is, has been developed uh, from the Idaho National Engineering uh, Laboratory, and uh, it is being maintained by a company. So these are thousands of dollars. And uh, I work at some point to provide some of the utilities, uh, PSENG in uh, uh, New Jersey, in fact, for two of its reactors, the Hope Creek uh, boiling water reactor and the Salem PWR uh, to build models uh, uh, using those best estimate codes. So in that case, I can save quite a bit of money. And of course, I would have those codes available in a house so that they can run uh, safety analysis without having to go to uh, the uh, uh, the manufacturers and the architect engineers for the evaluation models. I hope I can have some time to describe to you the best estimate codes. The evaluation models can be described uh, in the code of federal regulations. The code of federal regulation is the collection of laws uh, that uh, basically have to be 
satisfied before you can operate a nuclear power plant. You can go to the, our, uh, 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 our uh, reference library. Uh, if you get to the main library, uh, south of campus, and the, uh, you turn to the area of the reference library, uh, you can get to CFR part 20. CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulation, which has the laws of the United States, in fact, that tell you what you have to do to uh, satisfy in your, uh, when you operate a nuclear power plant from the safety uh, perspective. Anyway, uh, so this is a formal uh, uh, codes that have to show that uh, the, the, the temperature in, when you operate your nu nuclear power plant, even under conditions of uh, transients like an earthquake or a tornado or a, uh, or a hurricane, that uh, you will be operating it uh, safely. All right, so this is some situation that we worry about. Uh, calculations of clad ballooning with a careful accounting for the statistical uncertainties can also be done with the more public domain uh, best estimate codes. Uh, if I have time, I'll describe to you one of those codes. <clears throat> All right, so another interesting uh, uh, phenomenology of accent scan has been described and it's the, named the China syndrome. And uh, this is totally fictitious. Uh, however, many people uh, believe uh, that it can happen. And the idea of the China syndrome is this, is that suppose that you have an accent and a this is uh, the containment uh, diagram of a pressurized water reactor, PWR. Uh, and uh, the suggestion is that if you melt the core, and it did happen, in fact, in Chernobyl, as well as in uh, uh, one of the uh, units in Fukushima. In fact, TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, acknowledges that they had a core meltdown uh, in a bo boiling water reactor. In that case, this is a PWR. The boiling water reactor has the control rods coming in from uh, the bottom. Uh, so the core melted and leaked into the basement, the base under the reactor. This is supposed to be called the dry well under the reactor core. And they show us now that that molten material, which would be the fuel, uh, molten with the cladding, with the control rods, with all the materials in the core, we call it the corium material. That's the molten fuel can go through the pressure vessel and then embed itself uh, into the concrete. And uh, it can go to a, a given depth until, of course, a heat generation from the decay heat is stopped, but it can in fact go to uh, a depth into the concrete uh, under the reactor mat there. This is called the mat of the reactor and it is built on the bedrock here, whatever it is, sandstone or, uh, uh, or uh, limestone uh, in that case. Now, some people suggest that, oh, that uh, melting core will continue going down, 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 and then to the center of the earth and then exit from the other side of uh, the earth, uh, which is a physical impossibility, uh, as you all can tell, because once, even if it sent, uh, reaches the center of the earth, it would stay there, it would not keep going to the other side. So it's a totally fictitious accent, yet people publicized it and put it into uh, the shape of a movie by Jane Fonda and, uh, uh, people were and went and watched the movie. It was basically sensualization. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the maximum that that molten core material interacting with the rock can go down is maybe about uh, 10 to 15 meter at most as uh, shown uh, in this uh, diagram. And that would be from simulations and uh, estimate uh, for the core maybe melting the rock and uh, setting itself down one year after it happens, if we do not uh, take some actions to remedy the situation. Uh, in fact, before even that uh, molten metal would get uh, into the basement of the reactor here, uh, or the base mat, as it's called, the rock, uh, it may have reacted already with water right there and caused the, the steam explosion, the picture that I have shown you uh, for the borax uh, experiments. Uh, last time in the last lecture, as well as in the uh, Fukushima accident suspected in one of the reactors. And you could see that 
there is a great similarity between the two in general. All right, so if you get really the situation that uh, is more uh, statistical and uh, is that, in fact, it's not going to take the shape of a cylinder, uh, but it can take the shape of a pond or a little pool. Uh, it's the same way as uh, water after a rain accumulates in kind of uh, pools. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what now we call it the melt pool. It would be a mixture of the core material, the corium material with whatever material is uh, at the base mat on which we are building the reactor. It could be granite, uh, it could be sandstone, it could be uh, lime uh, stone. Uh, remember the term here, corium material, so that you can read the rest of the literature. Some people suggest that uh, uh, the radius here, R, from the center uh, takes basically a simple equation is equal to a constant Z multiplies into Z. Z would be along the Z axis here, the depths of the sinking uh, pool. And uh, you'll find that of course heat transfer occurs. So uh, the melt pool remains there for a little while. Uh, 0.5 uh, Delta T shows it. And uh, away from the molten pool, the temperature decreases. So uh, if it ever happens, and it has never happened, in fact, except maybe on one of the reactors at Fukushima, uh, you'll find that uh, at most it can reach something like 12 meters. It will never, ever go all the way to the center of the Earth. And even if it goes center of the Earth, it will not go back to China. So that Z to the one force power tells us that it is not going to look really uh, like shown in that diagram here it would look more like a pool. And that has basically uh, in, uh, 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 inspired the French, uh, the Arriva company to design basically a pool where if ever that type of an accident happens, the molten core, corium material will spread itself and simply radiate heat to the environment. Uh, initially, as we said in the decay heat uh, chapter, that you get 6%, uh, as heat uh, generation from the fission products, what we call the after heat, and then it decays very rapidly, 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, the amount of heat generated is very minimal. So they don't even pour water on it and try to cool it, like the debris beds that are confined in the pressure vessel. All they do is let it graduate its energy to the environment and then later on simply go and dig it out and dispose uh, of it uh, like uh, we dispose of the spent fuel or reactors. Uh, there are two situations that can present themselves uh, depending, as I suggested, uh, on the composition of the molten pool, which is a mixture of the corium material and the base mat of the reactor. Uh, one of them uh, is what we call the oxide melt. Uh, if the molten material is primarily oxides, uh, you'll find that it is miscible with the base mat, uh, it could be uh, uh, limestone, it could be concrete. Uh, well, yeah, it is concrete. There is some concrete there, uh, but uh, uh, it could be limestone, sandstone. And if you have oxides, then uh, basically the molten material would mix with it. Miscible means that it can mix with it. Uh, a miscible molten of a limited depth is just three meters only, uh, would be formed and with a radius of about 13 meters. So the width here would be 13 meters, and the depths could be no more than three meters. This one is shown here as, yeah, this is a three meter shown here as a matter of fact. Uh, the pool would remain molten for a period of a few years. Uh, the temperature around the pool will remain above the ambient temperature of the underlying rock as the generated heat is dissipated uh, in the rock around the pool. And in one of the designs, as I'll show you, it would radiate to the environment. If we do not provide any cooling, this is simulations that tells you that within 20 minutes, uh, the molten pool would be at a depth of zero. Uh, after four and a half days, it may go deeper. In fact, four and a half days to a depth of maybe two meters. The dimension here is meter, 32 days, it can go to six meters. And at most, uh, the maximum penetration that can ever happen is 14 meters. No China. Uh, <laughs> Uh, China should not worry about that whatsoever. Uh, the, another uh, uh, possibility is basically then you can get a molten uh, steel melt. 
if the melting process from the pressure vessel, the pre if the pressure is, uh, vessel itself made out of steel uh, melts, it can dissolve the fission products from the molten pool. And if the molten steel oxidizes, the molten pool will be miscible with the concrete and rock. And the situation like the previous case now uh, arises. And it happened in one of the reactors, in fact, uh, around Detroit. And uh, uh, basically the corium material embedded itself in the concrete and they simply spent time uh, pu pulling it out of the uh, concrete. It was a nefast reactor uh, and uh, they wrote a book about it. We almost lost Detroit, which is not really uh, factual at all. In this case, the molten mixture will continue penetrating the base rock deeper. Uh, a molten immiscible pool can now penetrate further, but only to a depth of about 14 meters. So if you get the situation where the molten core also melts the pressure vessel, which here is made out of steel, uh, you can think about no more than 14 meter of depth with the penetration of the molten core. If it is oxide melt and oxide melt, it remains very close, close to the surface. Uh, the maximum depth would be no more than three meter. And this is all models that assume that you have no cooling whatsoever. Uh, the chemical interaction of the molten fuel and the concrete is more likely to generate significant amounts of the water in the concrete as seen. You know that uh, uh, when you pour concrete, uh, you cure it by pouring water on it. Uh, so the concrete contains a very a significant amount of water. When you start heating it with molten metal, you release that steam, but also you can release it in the form of hydrogen. So that hydrogen would be very reactive. And uh, we worry about uh, hydrogen explosions uh, in that case. So in that case, uh, other gases are released from the concrete, particularly uh, the hydrogen. Uh, the steam and gases generation would uh, more likely lead to the, the pressurization of the containment structure over an extended period of time and eventually fail it. And uh, you'll find that the steel, uh, the, the containment structure, if it is not cooled, uh, would uh, release the radioactivity uh, to the environment if you do not provide cooling. So cooling becomes of the essence in a situation where such an accident occurs. Uh, this suggests that implementing a cooling process in the unlikely extreme situation of a core melts through event uh, is a scenario that is worthy of attention and not uh, the totally fictitious assumptions of that idea of the China syndrome. And uh, we know better now than uh, believe basically the fiction. It's fun maybe to watch uh, uh, the movie, The China Syndrome, but we know what are its limitations. Uh, because uh, these are accents and we, need to operate our nuclear power plants uh, uh, in a safe way. Uh, uh, we want uh, to design systems that would not leak uh, radiation to the environment. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, experiments uh, have been conducted. Uh, and uh, to understand really the phenomenology, how is it that uh, the elevated pressure in the containment can uh, 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 behave in the case of an accident. And in fact, uh, at Fukushima, this is uh, something uh, extremely important to study. Uh, the pressure in the containment increased to such a level that they could not operate the valves that would uh, release from the environment the hydrogen that was formed in the accident. So that was a miss that uh, has to be uh, uh, considered in future designs. Uh, but uh, we add now to uh, the, the uh, uh, containment structure, what we call the engineer safety features. These are uh, the containment uh, of uh, accidents in general, not just the six feet of concrete. Uh, the six feet of concrete are more like to protect the internals of the reactor from the outside elements, including a direct impact from uh, a large plane, a Boeing 740, uh, 747. Uh, or a missile like a, a light pole driven by tornado or hurricane winds at 100 miles per hour. So we need to protect the internals of the reactor itself. They are not there to stop the release of steam if we do not provide cooling. And in fact, uh, in the same way that we say that a chain breaks at its uh, uh, 
uh, the, uh, weakest link. This is an experiment of a containment built at the Sandia uh, Laboratories uh, in New Mexico. And you could see here, this is a pipe that either brings in uh, the coolant or takes the steam out that's more like a coolant. You notice that if you do not provide cooling inside the containment, sooner or later, sooner or later, the pressure increase is going to break the weakest links, which are the penetrations and the seal here. So that is a large 22 inch liner tear uh, uh, near a containment scale model piping penetration. So the weakest links would be the piping coming in and out from the containment as well as the uh, conduit for uh, the uh, uh, wiring and cables for the control of the system. Uh, I make here an interesting analogy of uh, 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 the need to cool the containment. And you'll find that in the generation three reactors already, like the AP600 and the AP1000, uh, that containment structure is cooled. Uh, and that's a, the, the new design that has been licensed for uh, 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 future. It's being uh, constructed uh, in different countries, including China, the AP1000. AP stands for advanced passive and 1000 is a 1000 megawatt electric. We'll discuss that in more detail when we deal with the uh, generation four uh, reactors. The concrete shell, uh, think about the, the little chick uh, that uh, is inside the egg. And uh, this has to do in general with shell structures in civil engineering. If you are a civil engineer, you'll understand this uh, better, but uh, think about uh, uh, the shell of an egg. And uh, uh, this is a structure where you get a chick there, a very small chick. Uh, and uh, basically the chick, uh, let's see here, the uh, little wing, the feet, and uh, uh, can apply pressure here, stress on the inside or the curvature, the uh, positive curvature of the shell and can break it very easily. That little uh, bird, <laughs> chick has not much energy. So in that case, it's very easy to break a shell if you apply stress on the positive kind of uh, 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 side of it. However, it resists uh, any kind of impact on the negative kind of, uh, 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 of the negative curvature in that case. Uh, you can think about uh, bridges, for instance, or doors made out of stone, because when you apply the stress here, uh, the stress propagates in this direction, whereas here it propagates in this direction and you can simply break any shell if you apply the pressure from the inside to the outside. Same for the containment structure of nuclear reactors. If you do not cool them uh, and provide enough cooling sooner or later, uh, maybe after hours, after days, uh, it, they will break uh, in that case. So in that case, the concrete shell uh, is meant again to protect the internals for outside stresses, not uh, for inside stresses. The structure would be very weak uh, in taking uh, the inside structure in general. And uh, this is why uh, for the pressurized water reactor, uh, uh, we designed the containment structure uh, with uh, uh, that shape in, in mind. Uh, we should not be fooled into thinking that the containment is really uh, the six feet of concrete there, pre-stressed concrete. This is really a biological shield. Uh, the containment is all the units and systems that would cool the reactor so that you do not allow the radioactivity to leak to the environment. So you could see here inside that six feet of concrete biological shield. It is protecting that gentleman here, the people standing outside the reactor against the radiation neutron and gamma radiation produced in uh, the reactor. Uh, the containment structure is that steel shell right here that is meant to contain the pressure and radioactivity release, including uh, preventing any of the weak links. Uh, and you need to understand that if you uh, would do any work in the nuclear field in, the oops, I really messed up here. Uh, and. Uh, I want to make that point. You should be the safety engineers that would object to any uh, stupidity by other people 
uh, uh, not understanding the, the physics of what's going on. Uh, so the steel shell is really uh, the containment uh, structure and uh, we have to cool it uh, under all conditions. And this is why uh, there are very interesting designs of containment structures that are operating now in our existing 40 and 60 year old power plants and now in operation. Uh, and we have to do better than what we have now. Again, you could see here that when we say containment, it is not that biological shield here. This is a biological shield surrounding the plant internals. It is, and then you have that steel shell here. See, they're making sure here that the steel shell is not the same as the concrete structure. And inside that uh, steel shell, in some of the designs of the pressurized water reactors by the Westinghouse company particularly, you'll find that they have a huge, huge refrigeration system that is producing of all things ice. So we call this an ice condenser. Inside that steel shell here, you could see here ice condenser. If you read it, let me magnify it a little bit without messing it. You see here, if you read ice condenser and the ice is there in case of the release of steam, uh, breaking some of the piping uh, to say, this would be the steam generator uh, or, and uh, this would be the accumulator tanks. That's an extra source of water that, uh, that is under uh, uh, 20 atmosphere. So if there is any break in the piping here, getting to the reactor, to the pumping system, to the steam generator, as a result may be of an earthquake, uh, you'll find that any release steam would be quenched uh, by the ice there. And you do not allow the pressure to build up inside the reactor vessel. So uh, the accumulator tanks uh, uh, are a source of extra water for cooling. There is also another source of water in pressurized water reactor, which is the refueling water storage uh, tank. So uh, let us uh, understand today that containment does not mean that six feet of concrete at all. It means the uh, units and uh, the different uh, components like the control rods are part of the containment system. You shut down the chain reaction, a boron injection tank that would be also uh, pumping boron into the core. Boron is a very strong absorber for neutrons. So it would shut down the chain reaction if the control rods Say if you get flat ballooning and we cannot insert the control rods, uh, the boric acid and the boron would shut down the chain reaction, replacing the uh, re uh, replacing the control rods. So here it is. Uh, I want you to uh, be able to know these. I'll ask you a question, uh, maybe uh, in the test about what are the engineer safety features for the pressurized water reactor. We have also a set of those for the boiling water react. Uh, the first uh, engineer safety features in terms of safety is the control rods. Uh, the control rods would shut down the main chain reaction, say 3000 megawatt thermal of power. Uh, the decay heat, if you shut down the chain reaction, still has to be uh, cooled. And uh, that would be, as we said in the previous chapter on decay heat generation, 6% initially, uh, but it decays over a 24 to 48 hour period. The containment vessel and its containment spray system inside some of the containment designs, you'll find uh, I'm not able to move around here easily. So be patient with me and uh, so that I can describe it to you. Uh, there is a spray system not shown here. Uh, maybe I can show it in another diagram. I hope that that would be touch screen, but it is not. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, here we have basically, uh, this is a component in the engineer safety features called uh, the reactor, uh, the refueling, our refueling water storage tank, uh, where you can pump water and spray water inside the steel shell of the containment and that water would quench or basically condensate any steams that is released say in the case of a reactor accident. All right, so let us uh, see if we can go back without messing up the system here. Uh, I don't have full control on it. Uh, let's look uh, on the list of the engineer safety features. Uh, the accumulator tanks, as I suggested, uh, uh, contain a source of water also under 20 atmosphere pressure. If for any reason the 
system uh, in the reactor, the uh, pressure is increased beyond 20 atmosphere, uh, those uh, uh, water uh, accumulator tanks will immediately come into action and provide uh, water for the cooling system. We have also a heat exchanger that is meant just for the decay heat removal uh, for the fission product that should last at least for 24 to 48 hours. Now, initially, if you have an accident, uh, the pressure in the core of a pressurized water reactor is about 2,000 uh, PSI or pound per square inch absolute. So if you want to pump water into something that has an, uh, a pressure of 2,000 PSI, you need a system that uh, can surmount that pressure. So in that case, you need pumps that can generate a very high pressure. But if you studied the hydraulics, you'll find that pumps that generate a very high pressure uh, basically have a, 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 a finite amount of energy. So they can only pump uh, a small flow rate of the liquid. So as an operator, you would uh, uh, intervene and depressurize the system. So initially, you provide cooling to the core with a high pressure injection system. Uh, the operators call it the IPSI. They do not pronounce it correctly. It's HPIS for high pressure injection system. And after you depressurize the reactor vessel, then you have access to another system that's called the low pressure injection system. So if you now have a pump that operates at high at low pressure, it can inject a much larger flow rate of water. So uh, you could depressurize the system intentionally, and you'll see that <clears throat> that happened in the Three Mile Island accident. The high pressure injection generates uh, a pressure in the range of 30 bars. Bars means barometric, or barometric pressure is atmospheric pressure. Uh, the low pressure injection system operates at 30 atmospheres to still provide water under pressure to cool the reactor core. Suppose that uh, you get the clad ballooning, and uh, uh, in that case, uh, uh, you cannot insert the control rod and stop the uh, fission chain reaction. This is a very serious situation. So uh, pressurized water reactors automatically would inject uh, boron, uh, in, uh, boric acid basically as a liquid uh, into the core. And uh, in that case, the boron is a very strong absorber of neutrons. In fact, it is uh, used in the control rods, but now it's the form of a liquid to shut down the chain reaction. And uh, you get an excess supply of water from the refueling storage tank. So these are uh, eight of the engineer safety features. And these are really the containment of a nuclear reactor. That is a containment system, not the biological shield that people mistake as being the containment structure. And uh, you'll find many professionals telling you, oh, the containment structure is a concrete shield. It is not. It is more like a biological shield and the protection of the internal of the uh, react. So this diagram shows us here how one of those co containment structures, uh, the steel shell here, uh, one uh, uh, inch thick shell, uh, can draw water with pumps from the refueling water storage tank, uh, spray the containment internals, uh, quench any steam. It goes to a sump at the bottom of the core. We'll study that. Uh, uh, as a, a human error later in the Three Mile Island accident. And that sump goes to uh, basically uh, a heat exchanger uh, to cool the water and bring it back and spray it inside the containment structure. The water that is sprayed inside the containment structure would contain sodium iodide. And in that case, it interacts with any iodine uh, uh, released in the atmosphere of the reactor and then goes back down to uh, the pump. So let us see what is the function and types of essential equipment in uh, the dry well and inside the containment structure. The dry well is the area right under the reactor core and it's supposed not to have water. If it has water, then, oh, we mentioned that that was a design flaw of the RBMK-1000, the Chernobyl type of a design where the water interacted with the, uh, where the corium material, the molten metal, interacted with the uh, water under the core and caused the monumental uh, steam explosion in that case. So you'll find that uh, 
you'll find that uh, the containment spray isolation valves uh, and the hydrogen igniters, now these failed uh, to, in the Fukushima accident because they, the design was such that the containment pressure itself increased and did not allow the springs on the valves to uh, pump the hydrogen out of the containment structure and made it more serious. Now, hydrogen, as we said, comes in from the interaction of very high temperature steam with any metal. Uh, and uh, this would be the uh, functions uh, in that case. Uh, in uh, many of the reactors in operation, we have what's called a sparger. Uh, in that case, you get the hydrogen to be bubbled underwater, and then you use a spark plug, actually star a car spark plug to ignite it in a controlled way and not let it uh, explode uh, in a destructive way like what happened at Fukushima. And uh, in fact, in the Three Mile Island accident, there is an indication that there may have been a minimal uh, spark uh, by the, through the generated hydrogen in general. So in that case, uh, we have, uh, I, I need to finish uh, that uh, part here, please uh, uh, be patient. Uh, these are the design characteristics of an uh, existing containment system, the different uh, power plants. But look at the time if we do not provide cooling uh, where that containment structure fails. Uh, the SP uh, Zion plant would fail within 16 uh, hours. Uh, the SP Sequoia Browns Ferry would also fail very quickly. So we need to provide design features that would deal with the uh, cooling and uh, uh, reducing the containment uh, pressure. Uh, next time, we're going to look at all the different designs of containment that we have in the United States and different parts of the world. And uh, I'll leave that for next time. And thank you for your, uh, your attention. Uh, uh, I thought that the uh, tests would be Friday. No, it's Monday, so we have some extra time uh, to do some more, uh, cover some more chapters. Uh, I don't know what happened, uh, Alvaro. Let us investigate.